Greetings, my name is Dr. Eric Landrum from the Department of Psychology at Boise State University, and this is a lecture for my capstone history and systems class on Wundt and the founding of psychology. Historians of psychology could certainly debate and have debated in the past about when psychology could be founded and who would be labeled the founder of psychology, but typically the uh, current opinion uh, settles on Wilhelm Wundt, who lived from 1832 until 1920. The zeitgeist at the time of Wundt was to truly ignore the practical applications of psychology, but focus on the ideas like the purpose of human existence. So just to give you a little bit of background, Wundt would have been in a department of philosophy because there was no department of psychology at the time he was uh, in ac academia. Uh, he would have uh, been thinking about these ideas through a philosophical perspective and I think sometimes students are surprised to understand that psychology, when it's founded in the date that we're going to use, and you'll see that on the next slide is 1879, that when psychology is founded, it's not about helping people. It's not about the helping professions that we typically think of psychology today, but really the zeitgeist at the time psychology was founded was to ignore those practical applications and to be a hard-nosed science. And so to look at, you know, why do we exist and how do we function? What are the, what are, what's the structure of consciousness? Things like that. And so there is no uh, movement for clinical psychology or abnormal psychology at the beginnings of psychology. Uh, it very much strove to be very scientific. It mimics physics in a lot of way in the founding of psychology. It wants formulas. It wants to understand not how the world works, but how the mind works, how the brain works, how our consciousness work together. And so that's this notion that Wilhelm Wundt brings from a, a philosophical perspective in the founding of psychology. So in 1874, Wilhelm Wundt publishes The Principles of Physiological Psychology, uh, a book uh, that, uh, in, in fact, uh, a very long book in which he sets out to establish psychology as a science. And so the basic premise is that uh, the mind works as a process, the mind is not a location. And again, we know for thousands of years that this brain body, this mind brain problem has existed. It, we talked about it when we talked about Descartes and other philosophical um, influences to psychology. And so for Wundt, the mind is not a location, but a process. Well, when he publishes the principles of physiological psychology in 1874, I think one could make the argument that that could be the founding date, 1874, but typically it's not, that's not accepted as the founding date of psychology. It is 1879 is the uh, acceptance of the founding of psychology. And so Wundt is employed at the University of Leipzig in Germany, uh, and he founds the, he, he is the founder of the first lab in the world for the study of experimental psychology. And so obviously philosophers and others had been studying human behavior since there's been human behavior. But what makes this important is that there's, this is the first time that space and resources are set aside and it's actually labeled the study of experimental psychology. And so 1879 is typically the starting date that most folks, uh, when they're talking about the history of psychology, that's the label, that's the date. If we were taking the eponymic approach and memorizing names and dates, that would be the one that we would memorize, 1879, as that starting date in psychology. Uh, just a couple of years later, in 1881, he founded, Wilhelm Wundt founded the first journal of psychology, and he called it Philosophical Studies. Now, you might think that that's kind of odd. And so here we are, uh, our founding, we're, we're coming out of philosophy departments at universities. Um, we're launching this new psychological science, the science of psychology, understanding the mind and processes and brain and the structure of consciousness and things like that. So why in the world would your first journal in psychology not be labeled psychological studies? That would make better sense than philosophical studies. You would think that'd be confusing. Well, the, the reason why Wundt did not call his journal Psychological Studies is that there already was a journal at the time 
named psychological studies. Sadly, however, that wasn't about psychology as the way you and I would typically think about it. Uh, the journal Psychological Studies, which was already in existence, was about psychic phenomenon. So it was about telekinesis and um, uh, telepathy and clairvoyance and precognition and things like that. So the name was already taken, so he couldn't label his new journal. He couldn't title it Psychological Studies. Wundt tried to describe what was going on, those processes of mind, remember, into these two big major categories. And almost like the words independent and dependent variable, it's really kind of too bad these words are so close to one another because it makes them easy to get confused. So Wundt talked about immediate experiences and immediate experiences. And you can see there uh, on your uh, screen, on the, on the video, uh, the definitions that he would use. And so Vaughn's interest was very much in the immediate experience. And so rather than listen to you say, I have a headache, he would want uh, an, someone doing introspection, someone describe, he would want the description of the experience. And so not your interpretation of it. It's almost like he was looking for the raw data and not your interpretation of the raw data. So for instance, if someone had a toothache, he would want them to describe the pulsing pain. The, uh, was it a sharp pain or a dull pain? Was it an ache? Was there a throbbing? Uh, he'd want you to describe the characteristics that you were experiencing. He would not want you to interpret for you and say, I have a headache. He would want those, what he would call immediate experiences. And so he'd want the raw, unfiltered, uninterpreted data, uh, not the uh, interpretation of, I have a headache. And so what Wundt did is that he trained others in his laboratory and his students uh, in this technique of introspection, where ideally one could, uh, by thinking carefully and following a protocol, you could uh, extract those immediate experiences rather than shoot to the chase, so to speak, you know, and get to the immediate experiences. So Wundt had this uh, methodology called experimental introspection. And so it was, oh, by the way, in the picture that you see here, uh, Wundt is seated. So that would be Wundt uh, uh, around some of the instruments and around some of his students um, in the laboratory. So to do Wundt's uh, version of uh, experimental introspection, you would be trained to report observations of mental events rather than just report what was in your memory. So again, not saying, oh yeah, I remember having a toothache. You would be trained very carefully to describe the experiences, to describe the sensations, the, um, the raw data, if you will, of what led you to that conclusion. So it's almost like before, it's immediate before you get to the conclusion. And when people slipped up and gave them, oh yeah, I remember that toothache, it was really bad, Wundt would call that a stimulus error. So that would be the, per the perceptions being reported rather than the sensation. And I think this sensation perception dichotomy really makes a lot of sense and is kind of a useful thing for us to think about. So think about vision for a second. So if we're talking about sensation perception, Sensation is that piece where these wavelengths of light come through your iris, come through your cornea, and hit your retina. And you know, there are rods and cones there, and they are going to take those light waves and they're going to translate them, uh, you know, Roy G. Biv and all that good stuff. And then those signals are sent through the optic chiasm to your brain. Right. Well, that whole process of grabbing the data and then translating it, or actually it was called transduction, transducing it into electrochemical um, messages is, is called transduction. And that's the sensa sa sensation. The perception is what your brain makes sense of. And so, oh yeah, that's blue. Oh, I love that shade of blue. Or, wow, that car is moving really fast. So the sensation was the data collection and the perceptions, the data analysis. And I think that's a nice parallel to these notions for Wundt. So good experimental introspection was about data collection. It was about sensation, except about what was going on in the mind. But if someone skipped to the chase and then all of a sudden interpreted what was going on, I see blue, I see a car moving fast, that would have been perception. And for Wundt, perception would have been what he would call a stimulus error. 
I don't want you to interpret what you see. I want you to tell me the raw sensory data that's being input through the retina, or in his case, input into the mind. I don't want you to interpret what's going on there and make sense of it. I want the data. I want to understand the data that your brain is collecting and not the perception. I don't want to, I don't want to hear the analysis that your brain would offer to explain those phenomena. Just a little bit about Wundt's philosophical approach, and you'll see a little bit of this repeated from prior lectures because there were antecedents to psychology that influenced Wundt. So, for example, uh, Wundt's philosophical approach was very much anti-metaphysical. To get what anti-metaphysics means, it's probably important to understand what metaphysics means, and so I've got a little definition there for you. So metaphysics is the principle of going beyond mechanical and physical analyses, and so it's, you know, the whole is greater than some of its parts. There's something beyond that. And so Wundt was anti-metaphysical, which meant that we only analyze the data that we've got in front of us. So again, that's that nice data collection versus data analysis. I only want the, the raw data. I don't want to do anything to it. I don't want to apply formulas to it. I don't want to take it and, and uh, have a linear transformation or anything like that. I want the raw data. So Wundt was, and it kind of makes sense if you understand what uh, he'd been talking about and writing about for some time, that he was anti-metaphysical. But also he took this mental chronometry approach, and we saw this in one of the earlier antecedents. This is where that notion of the two, uh, you know, the two astronomers are uh, tracking uh, the movement of objects in the night sky, and they're trying to get the exact same times down, and the times are slightly different, and that leads to this notion of individual differences, and so that mental chronometry. And so complicated reaction times are the sum of, of individual acts, and that was Donders, a Dutch physiologist who started to lay the groundwork for that, that uh, Wundt then tried to time cognitive acts in the laboratory, and he had those elaborate instruments that you saw at that table he was sitting at, where he was he would try to time the the uh, the amount of uh, uh, cognitive processing of introspecting. He would try to time that and kind of gauge that, and maybe something that was more complicated to introspect was achieved in a longer frame of time than something that was relatively easier to introspect, and so. You can see that zeitgeist here. It's very mechanical. We want to kind of dissect what's going on. We want to see the pieces and parts. We don't want to go on beyond the pieces and parts. We don't want to fabricate complicated, you know, explanations. It's very anti-metaphysical. It's very concrete. What's in front of us is what's important. Very much about the sensation and the data collection, not so much about the perception and the data analysis. This mental chronometry, just to kind of end up on uh, some of the ideas that uh, Wundt tried to forward throughout his life, you know, there were these processes that Wundt hypothesized, and that we, if we could time them, then we could see about more complex thoughts as compared to uh, lesser complex thoughts. So this mental chronometry had these three steps that you see before. So, and, 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 you know, you can read them there. I guess I'll read them to you because I'm talking to you right now. But that middle one's the one I want to come back to, the one that's got the asterisk. And so uh, there, the, pro the proposal was that there were three parts to this notion of mental chronometry. Apprehension, apperception, and then voluntarism. So apprehension was the admission of sensory impressions into consciousness, that passive process. So this might be, you know, how things were entering uh, one's mind. Uh, if we were talking about the visual system, this would be the impinging of the wavelengths on the retina, the in the back of your eye, right? The apperception was that paying attention, that phrase that we use all the time, paying attention to the impression, the process of attending to it. So what is to the particular perceptions was attended to is apperceived and so this would be focusing our effort and so for visually this would be for example turning our head so that um, the most wavelengths could hit the fovea where there was a great concentration of rods and cones and so we get the best visual acuity when light is hitting our uh, fovea which is uh, part of the retina but in the Wundtian system in terms of mind and brain and process, this would be, you know, this introspection. So we're going to apply this process systematically that we've been trained to do. We're going to tune in. We're going to focus our attention on the immediate 
uh, processes the immediate experiences that are going on right now. So we've got the app apprehension, which is the capturing of the data. We've got the apperception, which is focusing on that incoming data. And then we've got that third step voluntarism, the power to organize contents of mind into higher level thought processes. This is where we're going to make sense of it. So this is where we're going to interpret it. This is where we are going to um, draw conclusions from it. Uh, here's where we're going to apply our knowledge and our training to figure out what does this really mean? What is this, what's going on in terms of the mental process? And so I think the parallel for the visual example would be the perception. Uh, so that's, we see, we can focus on an image in the distance or we can see something in the foreground. Um, and so the proposal here in the early days of uh, Wundtian psychology was this three-part mental chronometry process, apprehension, apperception, and voluntarism. And I put an asterisk next to uh, apperception because it's not a term that you hear a lot these days, although there's one place where this term still continues to exist. Um, and depending on whether or not you've had Psych 421, psychological measurement or not, you may not be familiar where that term exists. Do you have any idea? Here, I'll pause. Go ahead. You can guess. No, that's not it. Try again. No, sorry, that's not it either. So, um, app, you'll see the term apperception when there's a certain um, acronym spelled out called the TAT. And the TAT, uh, it stands for the Thematic Apperception Test, and it's uh, kind of a relative of the Rorschach test in that um, uh, you could use this in a therapeutic situation where um, the TAT is comprised of, oh, I think it's like 38 or 40 uh, black and white images. Car they were printed on cardstock, and uh, you could present these kind of vague images to uh, a patient or a client, uh, and then uh, they would have to describe and they would have to describe the story or describe the thoughts of the person in the in the image or the situation they're seeing in the environment and then the trained uh psychotherapist then would 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 draw some conclusions from um these um interpretations of very vague stimuli I, and, and this really isn't related to Wundt other than I wanted to show you where this word apperception you know, kind of still exists with us today with regard to the TAT and just for fun, I'm going to show you some examples of uh, TAT cards. And so you can imagine if you're in therapy and someone were to show you this, and so you could ask the person, well, look at this guy right here. Uh, tell me what he's thinking. And so over a series of cards, you might be able to think about what underlying themes that might emerge. So rather than t you know asking the therapist or the therapist asking a client, so what's wrong with you? which that person may or may not be able to you know, ascertain, uh, you could do things like this, where you could have uh, folks tell a story. So you have a um, patient look at an image like this and say, what do you think the little boy is thinking about? And again, if you systematically did this over time, if you did it over a number of cards, so you could ask, what's the man on the left thinking? What's the woman on the right thinking? You know, you might be able to figure out some of those themes or underlying processes. Um, here's another one. I'm just showing you some examples just because they're kind of fun. And then here's, here's the last one I'll show you. And so you could ask, uh, you know, so the boy is staring at the violin. So what do you think he's thinking? You know, what, what kind of thought processes do you think? And so it's kind of a, I, I show it because it's a nice continuance of this notion of apperception. That word still exists in our psychology vocabulary. And there's some similarity in terms of are there underlying themes that can emerge? You know, could we get a, a participant, a, a patient, to think about that immediate experience in the way that Wundt would have thought about it? And so just trying to get at some of that raw underlying data as opposed to, well, tell me why you're not feeling so good, or that kind of thing. Anyway, uh, that's it for me and Wundt and the 